has written many books uh, and is acclaimed and for her literary talent. She's the chair today and we'll be keeping order. A friend of mine, and I met her many years ago, I was just a kid, 40 years ago, oh my god, <laughs> a little longer than I could have thought. <laughs> She's uh, written a few books, uh, seven I think altogether, two of which I've read, One, the last two, Outlaw, Red, uh, Outlaw Woman and Red Dirt, um, Outlaw Woman's fascinating history of reading the eight little food, but it's also her life too, and Red Dirt is her upbringing in Oklahoma, and I love, uh, I love that story because it used to be Indian territory. And it's such a conundrum for the United States even today. Oklahoma remains, for many people, Indian territory. <laughs> On the positive and the negative side. So she has defined the term engaged intellectual through a life spent on the frontiers as an intellectual of the past four decades of social struggles. She has never not been an intellectual. She was quite young when I met her and she was quite intellectual then. But I also appreciate that she was one of the most understandable intellectuals I'd ever met and sharp. She has never abandoned her roots through the pro process of becoming one of the most respected left academics in the United States. I'll give you the distinguished pat. The Artist Laureate of Ontario, I, I recently won the uh, Premier's Award, and it, it's sort of my last month to uh, brag about it, because I'm going to pick somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and some of my books are out there, too. So we are having a round table, and what I'm going to do is you're going to make a presentation. And do you want to start or finish? I think you should start. Okay. Yeah. Roxanne is going to start, and then we're going to work our way to their life. <laughs> okay. I'm going to. I'll stand up. I'm an asthmatic, so I I have more air than standing up. And I thank all of you for coming. What a nice place this is, a venue for, in the halls of a law school where most of the law was created to um, persecute Native people and for land rights. <laughs> but it's changing with indigenous involvement in Canada, First Nations. Um, well, I, so I, I really want to thank the organizers and uh, the co-sponsors and many co-sponsors of this roundtable. It's an extraordinary event for me, and especially my friend uh, Rob Alberton, you've already met, who is a professor emeritus at York University, a political scientist, and an author of many, many books, and um, a, an outstanding intellectual who, I, we were in graduate school together, and we go back 50 years <laughs> at UCLA. But Rob was one of these famous draft dodgers, as you call them, <laughs> in Canada, who fled the United States Vietnam War and has stayed ever since. And he's a Canadian now. So I was very proud of him at the time. And uh, it was a very brave thing to do. Uh, he finished his dissertation yet. He finished it here. So Rob is, and I really honor him. And I think John here, who's uh, done so much of the, the work for this, and uh, anyone else involved, I know that a lot of work put in, got put into bringing together these, this extraordinary uh, group of uh, scholar, intellectual, activists. So, um, I think, I just want to mention that um, these um, scholars, among many other indigenous First Nations scholars, 
and non-Indigenous scholars who work in solidarity and do studies that are um, no longer colonial, colonialists like Victoria. Um, I couldn't have done this book even 20 years ago without that accumulated scholarship. I don't think I could have even finished it 10 years ago. And a year since it, the book has been published, at least a dozen new books, including Boyd's book, um, had, have come out from indigenous scholars that I wasn't even, I didn't even have access to. Or there's some things I actually would have changed or added in the text. So it's kind of a work in progress as I see it, a consensus. It does focus on the United States, but of course it resonates since Canada and the United States are both Anglo colonized and have many similarities and behave exactly the same way at the United Nations, um, along with New Zealand and Australia. They're Anglo colonial buddies. <laughs> um, so I hope it will resonate, and then um, these, uh, those who are more familiar with uh, Canadian indigenous issues are on the panel and will bring out other aspects. But what I want to talk about today is from um, one chapter in the book uh, called Doctrine of Discovery, because it applies really to the whole colonized world, all of Africa, the Pacific, all of the Americas. And first I'll tell this, this story. In 1982, the government, this was like 10 years before the 500 year anniversary of Columbus' first voyage. So in 1982, the government of Spain and the Holy See, as they're called at the UN, but it's the Vatican, you know, Pope and his ambassadors, and they are a, a non-voting state member of the United Nations. So as such, along with Spain, the socialist government of Spain, not, Franco, not the fascist government, they proposed to the UN General Assembly that the year 1992 be celebrated in the United Nations as an encounter, encounter between Europe and indigenous peoples of the Americas honoring Europeans for having brought the gifts of civilization and Christianity. Well, to the shock of the North Atlantic states that supported Spain's resolution, including the United States and Canada and all of Western Europe, they were joking around, you know, about it, and the Irish saying, well, we think we were there first, and the Norwegians saying, the Vikings were there first, and, you know, laughing and, and talking. And suddenly, in that room, is you know, a big hall at the UN. Everyone's seated in alphabetical order. And I was sitting up in the, you know, where the non-governmental organizations have to sit. You don't get to say anything. And all of the Africans, the representatives of the African states, rose up and walked out. This was before text messaging. This was before any means of communication. <laughs> And later I asked, uh, you know, one of the African friends, ambassadors, how did, how did you organize that walkout? Did you know it was coming up? They said, it was a complete surprise to them, to everyone. I was shocked. I was fainted when I heard it presented. And he said, it was just a gut reaction. Everyone, no one signaled. We all just got up and walked out. And they came back. They had a meeting. They closed down the session. And they, um, they came back after about an hour with a statement, an impassioned statement, condemning a proposal that would celebrate the onset of European colonialism and the uh, Atlantic slave trade. In the United Nations, which was established, as they pointed out, for the purpose of ending colonization. So that's basically the doctrine of discovery, rearing its head in the wrong place. The resolution was dead, but it was not the end of efforts by Spain, the Vatican, and others in the West, Europeans, to make the quincentennial a cause for celebration. Only five years before that incident in the UN General Assembly, 
the Indigenous Peoples of the Americas Conference at UN Geneva headquarters had proposed that 1992 be made a UN year of mourning for the onset of colonialism, African slavery, and genocide of the Indigenous Peoples of the Americas. And that October 12th be designated as the UN International Day for the World's Indigenous Peoples. <coughs> then Spain and the Vatican started fighting this proposal, as well as the Reagan administration, as you could guess, uh, in the United States and the Canadians, uh, to not allow that. If the other wasn't allowed, this wouldn't be allowed either. So Spain and the Vatican spent years and large sums of money preparing for their own celebrations of Columbus, bribing and threatening um, in all kinds of ways their investments in Latin America, enlisted every state in Latin America and the Caribbean except one that refused. Can you guess which one refused? Cuba. Cuba. <laughs> Fidel said, <laughs> Know that you're, you have only two choices, to be on the side of the colonizer, on the side of the colonized. And the Cuban people cannot be on the side of the colonizer. So they paid for it with withdrawn Spanish financial investments, as very few countries invested in Cuba under the blocking. And they punished them for about a year. In the United States, the George H.W. Bush administration cooperated with the project and produced its own series of events with taxpayer money. In the end, at the United Nations, we won, indigenous peoples won, a decade for the world's indigenous peoples. It officially began in January 1993, but was inaugurated at UN headquarters in New York in the fall of 1920. 1992. And then August 9th, not October 12th, was designated as the um, UN International Day for the World's Indigenous Peoples. But the, the really important thing that year was that the Nobel Peace Prize went to Guatemalan Mayan leader Rigoberto Menchú, and it was announced in Oslo on October 12th, 1992 a decision that infuriated the Spanish government in the Vatican and they withdrew their ambassadors for a time. So these organized celebrations of Columbus really flopped because what happened was a real turn, a, a real um, new OCA happened during this time. All kinds of uprisings throughout Latin America and protests and blockades against um, the Quincentennial. And so, so many people who had not been informed before, because it made news, you know, because uh, uh, these states were pushing it so much, it really put Columbus Day on the map. Not that they took it off the United States, it's still a federal holiday. A week from uh, yesterday is um, the federal holiday when everything is closed down and they celebrate Columbus and we all celebrate <coughs> on Columbus, on Columbus Day. Well, back to the doctrine of discovery. That sort of gives an idea of how it plays out now to some extent. But according to this centuries-old doctrine of discovery, European Christian nations acquired title to the lands they, quote, discovered. And the indigenous inhabitants of that land lost their natural right to the land after Europeans arrived and claimed it. Under this legalistic cover for theft, Euro-American wars of conquest and settler colonialism devastated indigenous nations and communities, ripping their territories away and transforming the land into private property. Arcane as it may seem, the doctrine of discovery remains the basis for U.S. federal laws still in effect that control indigenous people's lives and destinies, even their histories by distorting them, as evidenced by recently with the canonization of the Spanish colonizer of the California indigenous people, Junipero Serra. 
by the good folk. <laughs> So from the mid-15th century to the mid-20th century, most of the non-European world was colonized under the doctrine of discovery, including Canada and the British. One of the first principles of international law that Christian Europe, European monarchies, promulgated to legitimize, investigate, map, and claim land belonging to peoples outside of Europe. It originated in a papal bull in 1455, and this isn't just history, this is still active law, uh, inscribed in the United States. And that one, that papal bull permitted the Portuguese monarchy to seize West Africa for slave, slave raiding. So that was the beginning of the Atlantic slave trade. At first it was between Lisbon and West Africa, and then with Columbus it jumped over to across the Atlantic. So following Columbus's infamous exploratory voyage in 1492, sponsored by the king and queen of a, of a nascent uh, Spanish state, another papal pool extended similar position, uh, permission to, the, to Spain, the Spanish monarchy. Disputes between the Portuguese and Spanish monarchies, especially in the Brazil, you know, the, where they were both uh, trying to colonize in the Amazon region. This led to the papal initiated Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494, which besides dividing the globe between those two powers, yes, that's why the Philippines is Spanish and Brazil is Portuguese and Goa was uh, Portuguese, Indonesia was Portuguese. A lot of these got taken by other imperialists like the Dutch took the uh, Indonesia and the British took some of the islands, but that first 80 years of colonization, Spanish and the Portuguese owned the world, the whole world. So this doctrine, on which all European states relied, originated with the arbitrary and unilateral establishment of the Iberian monarchy's exclusive rights under Christian canon law to colonize foreign peoples. And this right was later seized by other European monarchical colonizing projects, namely the, the British and the French and the Dutch, all of them. <coughs> but it wasn't just monarchies. The French Republic, after the French Revolution, used this legalistic instrument for its 19th and 20th century settler colonialist projects in North Africa. Southeast Asia and the South Pacific, as did, of course, the newly uh, United States and Canada when they continued the colonization of North America begun by the British. Indeed, the popular settler colonialism of those republics proved to be the most insidious, including genocidal policies in the case of Anglo colonized North America. Indicating the intention of the newly independent United States in 1792, Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson um, asserted that the doctrine of discovery developed by European states was international law applicable to the United States government as well. This goes completely against the narrative of, of the United States as this republic that wasn't a colonizing are not engaged in foreign affairs. And even before that, they were already in the Mediterranean attacking the uh, Berbers, um, which gave the name to the Marine Corps that was formed at that time. And there, when they invaded Mexico from Veracruz in 1847, they wrote their anthem, which is still in their anthem, from the, from the halls of Montezuma, to the shores of Tripoli. No one in the United States ever asked, why it's Tripoli? Tripoli. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even know that the US was already an overseas imperialist power at the same time it was colonizing North America. <clears throat> yeah, imperialism started in 1898. That's what the textbooks say. <laughs> when they invaded the Philippines. <laughs> 
So writing for the majority, um, oh, the U.S. government codified the doctrine of discovery as domestic law in 1823. The U.S. Supreme Court issued the decision Johnson versus McIntosh. Any of you law students here? I know we're in a law student space, but I oh good. Um, <laughs> I don't know if there's legislation on, in Canada. I tried to find out, and I couldn't. I mean, it's really hard to find these things. It's pretty obvious in the United States, but there are different processes that, and sometimes it's just common law. And Supreme Court decisions enter the common law, which is a, a recognized by the Constitution. So it literally becomes constitutional law, a Supreme Court decision. So writing for the majority, these were Cherokee uh, cases about the Cherokee Nation in Georgia have been reduced from a larger area of treaties and all to uh, a large part of what is today Georgia and had already become a state of Georgia. So here's the Cherokee Nation right in the middle of this, uh, this state. Um, and writing for the majority, Chief Justice John Marshall held that the doctrine of discovery, he named it as such, had been an established principle of European law and of English law in effect in British, Britain's and North American colonies, and was also the law of the United States. The court defined the exclusive property rights that a European country acquired by dint of discovery, writing, discovery gave title to the United States government by whose subjects or by whose authority it was made against all other European governments which title might be consummated by possession. Therefore, European and Euro-American discoverers had gained real property rights in the lands of indigenous peoples by merely planting a flag. Of course, they were met with resistance by the peoples they claimed to have conquered or discovered, <laughs> which is a major theme of, of, of my book. Indigenous rights were, in the court's words, in no instance entirely disregarded, but were necessarily to a considerable extent impaired. That's pretty convoluted language. Uh, the court further held that indigenous rights to complete sovereignty as independent nations were necessarily diminished. Indigenous people could continue to live on the land at the, if they were given the permission by the federal government but the title resided in the discovering power of the United States. The decision concluded that native nations were domestic dependent nations. This is still the colonial law that controls native people in the United States, federally recognized native people. But soon it turned out that the indigenous nation in question, the Cherokee, was not allowed to remain in its territory, and the Cherokee citizens were deported en masse on the Trail of Tears, which killed half their population on the, on the journey, on foot, driven by the army. This, is, this also happened to all of the Muscogee peoples who were deported to Indian territory, which is now Oklahoma, where I grew up. And then all other Native nations east of the Mississippi. So we have 50 different nations represented in, in Oklahoma. And they have all uh, people who were left behind, who didn't go, hid out, or um, simply they, they were then not considered criminals or anything. The U.S. wouldn't hunt them down, but they had no rights, no collective rights, no status. They were just U.S. the men, U.S. citizens, um, women weren't yet, you know, couldn't vote. And Indians couldn't vote either, but only if they were under the U.S. Um, um, guardianship. So all of those people have regrouped in the last 60 years and sued for federal, federal which is kind of tricky because that just puts them under U.S. trust, but it, it, it's at least a certain security, very complex, um, that choice. So the doctrine of discovery is so taken for granted in the United States that it is rarely mentioned in historical or legal texts 
use in public schools or universities, including law schools. And it's a major legal court, you know, the Mark, John Marshall's the most famous of the Supreme Court justices. And almost everything he decided had some relationship with, um, with destroying the sovereignty of Native nations. And this is the legal basis on which the United States government controls Native nations under a continuing colonial system. And we know that because the doctrine was again, again invoked and validated in 2005 with a U.S. Supreme Court case, the city of Sherrill versus Oneida Nation of Indians, in which the 1820s U.S. Supreme Court decisions were cited as precedent for denying Oneida Nation land claims. Well, the United Nations um, 2007 Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples specifically repudiates the doctrine of discovery. And most of the liberal U.S. Protestant churches, as well as the World Council of Churches, have called for its nullification. The Vatican will not even have a conversation. They have ambassadors at the UN, and they're mostly lawyers, international lawyers. So we've had access to them for, you know, for 30 years, um, starting in 1970, uh, 1977. And we get meetings with them and sit down and talk to them about repudiating their own papal bull. And they just say, oh, it's, you know, it, it's no longer really in effect. Said, you know, yes, it is. And it would give us a little ammunition, you know, to change, to revoke those Supreme Court decisions uh, if, if you would renounce what you created. Well, we could tell by the canonization last, uh, uh, when the Pope was here last month that it is still active from their point of view, and that's why they refuse to do anything. I, I just want to make one more point about the connection with uh, the doctrine of discovery and the ongoing, um, uh, the ongoing colonization. In the war on terror, so-called, after 9-11, um, when they created this uh, term unlawful combatant, for all the detainees that they put in Guantanamo and other sites to torture around the world. Their justification for torture was the Modoc prisoner's case. And the what, sorry? The Modoc prisoner's case, which Boyd's book uh, is about. Uh, so I won't go into it, but I hope, you know, I hope um, Boyd will, because it is uh, John Yu, the special, you know, special counsel who cited the 1873 Murdoch Indian prisoners opinion. This was a great rebellion. Uh, uh, the army rounded up after, you know, they had actually killed a general and um, quite a few soldiers, 2,000 soldiers in the lava beds running after 58 by Murdoch fighters. Uh, so they were captured, Captain Jack, Captain Rush, who was the leader, was captured, and they were tried in Hong. And in um, that Modoc prisoner case, it brings up the, um, the term homo sacer. And homo sacer in international law is a Latin term that um, is Roman law originally, a person banned from society, excluded from its legal protections, but still subject to the sovereign's power. Anyone may kill a homo sacer without it being considered murder. So they used that case. And then in 2011, lest we blame George W. Bush for everything um, under the Obama, well into the Obama uh, administration, first uh, administration, a Yemeni citizen's case was brought up, and they used, um, it was a military tribunal, and they used an 1818 tribunal about the Seminole War, people captured in the Seminole Wars in Florida, uh, that Andrew Jackson was the general at that time. And it actually says, not only was the Seminole belligerency unlawful, but much like the modern day Al-Qaeda, 
The very way in which the Seminoles waged war against U.S. targets itself violated the customs and usages of war. They were invading. It was Spanish territory. They were invading uh, the Seminole nation. But the way they fought back was with guerrilla warfare. So it actually seems that the war on terror <coughs> is the 21st century Indian war. And that's another theme of this book.